I welcome all participants and uh, students who are uh, uh, for this webinar out there. We'll just, uh, just welcome you all on behalf of North East Writers Forum. For those who do not know us and uh, for those who are coming very lately, uh, I'd like to tell you that North East Writers Forum was started, you know, like in 96, 1996. By some friends, you know, like some boys and girls who were interested in, you know, like writing, uh, who like to help each other, you know, like, and they're the same doubts which you and me have got. Uh, everybody has doubts regarding his writing. We need to show each other, you know, like, is it good? It's like cooking something and, you know, like you do not like cooking alone, you know, like if you cook it for somebody else and somebody appreciates it, you know, it's a, it's a, when you, you like cooking with more. Same goes with writing. Now, once they started this, this entire, when they started this with uh, the Writers Forum, and 97, they had, you know, uh, uh, registered it. And over the years, those boys and girls, those friends, you know, like who have helped each other, shared each other out there, and today has become, come, uh, I mean, like quite eminent writers, award-winning writers out there. And it made the forum into what it is today. We got eminent writers, authors and poets all over the Northeast. We got names like Arukumar Datta, Manal Sankisha, uh, Temsala Au, Mawandai, Robin Nangam, and the list is on Dhruba Hajarika. Dhruba Hajarika is then please our uh, president also. And we the, and the list is on, not to mention our very own uh, Rasmi Najari here. We got a title of it. Uh, her giving a bio and introducing her will be the job of our moderator. Before uh, giving it over to the moderator, I'd like to say that this entire webinar is our endeavor, the Notice Writers Forum endeavor to give you the technique to the thing. As you know, anything, whether it is sports, whether it is, you know, like uh, any other work you do, you need the proper technique of it. You must have seen in a garage where, you know, like a thin, maybe a mechanic, or one, uh, who would be a young kid who is changing maybe a tire of a huge tire of a truck. Now, you and me cannot do it. There is a particular technique to it. You cannot use strength out there because that truck, however big you are, or whatever strength you might have, you know, but that particular tire is huge. That needs a particular technique to get it out and you to change the tire. This is our mm -hmm. humble endeavor on behalf of North East Writers Forum to teach you that technique to uh, mentor, uh, to give you be that mentor of you so that you can write easily so that whatever writer's block or whatever uh, doubts you have been facing, which you have been having over the years, can be cleared, you know. Uh, our moderator for today is Dr. Pranami Bhattacharya. She is a, a, a assistant professor in English at uh, the Royal Global University here. Uh, she will be doing the, uh, 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 the, the deep pull out there, uh, uh, taking the, your question and answer. Over to you, Pranami. Okay, thank you, Dipanjal. And a uh, very good evening, everybody out here with us today. So um, uh, there's this renowned writer called Robert Mackey, you know, and I had read that once um, he had said that stories are the currency of human contact. And I so believe in that. Stories are the um, creative conversion of, the, of uh, life itself into a more powerful, clearer, more meaningful experience. We can say that. Everyone loves a good story and a story well told has the power to inspire, to motivate uh, and to involve its reader. Stories also help a person to relate and uh, retain information in a way that straight facts and data can't always achieve on their own. Don't you think so? I think so. A simple a uh, fact because of which I read books or try a hand at writing, not that I'm a writer per se, is because I um, firmly believe in this quote by uh, a writer called Vera Nazarian and which I oft keep using in conversations. It says, old storytellers never die, but they disappear into their own narratives. And um, I believe that this is uh, this charm of narration, you know, this charm of storytelling, this is the charm that has inundated every literary and um, um, historical age hitherto, up till now. Um, with that said, uh, being an effective storyteller, one uh, who can identify with stories to tell, when to tell them and how to tell them well, you know, I, um, this is very important. Once um, I had read uh, something about Ronald Reagan. You, I'm sure you all know him, right, students? Um, the uh, the late actor turned president who 
Republicans and Democrats alike as the um, great communicator, quote unquote, the great communicator. So he didn't start his speeches on the, uh, you know, something like the multilateral imperative of deficit reduction, nothing like that. He didn't use such jargons and, you know, high funda theories and all. So uh, with facts and figures, instead, you know, he, he, uh, he would tell you a story about a little girl in a yellow dress or something like that. And within a minute or two, even when the most um, uh, cynical listeners were unconsciously disarmed and pulled in by the parable, Reagan would move over to the hard business of the day stock. Um, so even if not all of us could be the best of the storytellers or are born storytellers, luckily for us, there uh, is a plethora of experts who are willing to share their insights. And uh, this evening, with a view to um, you know, be acquainted with uh, uh, one such person's, um, we have organized this evening with a view to be acquainted with one such person's insight, uh, who is one of the best storytellers from our region. Uh, Rashmi Sahitya Academy Awardee Rashmi Narzari. Rashmi Ba, a very good evening. I cannot welcome you to the Northeast Writers Forum. You are already a member of this family, but I welcome you uh, to this webinar. So um, Rashmi Nazari, as I have said, is a Sahitya Academy uh, author, awardee author, uh, creative writing mentor, and uh, independent editor. She sometimes dabbles in communication skills uh, as a consultant and also has some translations to her credit. Her works include his share of Sky that won her the Sahitya Academy for Children's Literature in 2016. She was also awarded the Prague Prerana Awards 2020 for Literature. As a create, uh, creative writing mentor, she has been a national finale mentor for Katha Utsav and has also mentored for the Indo-Japanese venture, Zuban Sas Sasakawa Peace Foundation Writing Methodology Grants. Of the translations that she worked on, the most, uh, the most that she cherishes are uh, a few of late Dr. Uh, Bhavindranath Saikya's uh, works. One of these uh, included uh, the transcreation of his Asmis radio play of the 70s, Hanto Histo Christo Pusto Moha Dusto into English. Uh, as an independent editor, Nazari has done uh, projects for UNICEF Assam and other firms. But to have a way, she loves to be introduced as the mother of a happily boisterous home of two children, uh, three pets, you know, which in, uh, three dogs, uh, pets, and a large flock of doves, pigeons, and house sparrows, which she manages with a wee bit of help from her husband, Hemondoda. And uh, so with this introduction, um, I would now uh, uh, declare the podium, uh, the stage open for Rashmi Narzari. Thank you, Panami. Thank you. I hope I am audible to everyone. Audible, yes. not edible. Yes. Okay. So, hey guys, welcome to Podshot for fine expression. We're here today to discuss and understand story writing and how you put your heart into the art of the matter. So before I just go, like we were discussing before the session started formally, we will look at the whole issue from the perspective of a writer, and we will not look at it from the perspectives of an academician. Also, um, I'd just like to tell you a few more things. You please will absorb everything, whatever we have here, whatever we discuss, you will take it, you will put it in here, lock it in there, leave it there, forget it. You will come back to it only for reference. And you will not use each and every word to the hilt, step by step, methodically. You know why? Because if you do so, that's not going to be your story. Everything will be so similar. Everything will be so like formulae in physics and chemistry. And your readers don't want monotony, they want variety. So we have to have unexpected surprises and surprises are always unexpected, of course. We need to have unexpected difference and variety in writing so that readers come back to more and more of your creation. Now we have the point, if you don't really need to use these 
then why do you need to attend these sessions at all? The point is, you have to know your rules to bend them. That's only if you know your addition, you know that two plus two is four. Now four is your beautifully crafted story and two plus two is four. Because you know your additions, you will also know that to come to four, you can use one plus one plus one plus one. Now, did I use four ones? Okay, I think I did. Or you can use three plus one, or you can use four plus zero. All of this will bring you back to the same thing, four. So four is your lovely story, but to arrive at four, you have used a different uh, you have used different numbers each time. Why could you do it? You could do it because you knew your addition. And that precisely is why we need to know our methods. We need to know our techniques so that we can bend and maneuver around them to come to different uh, strategies, different plots each time to arrive at four. So that's it. And before we go on to the very basics of story writing, the very basic, the usual, you know, you'll get all of it on the internet. But what you don't get on the internet is what you want to write about. And how do you know what you want to write about? It should be something you're passionate about. It should be something your heart holds dear. Otherwise, you will lose track somewhere in between. Not just because, you know, someone wrote this story, it was so beautiful. It was about adventure, but you know absolutely nothing about adventure that you have to go and write something relating to adventure. No, that's wrong. You follow your heart. And how do you know how you follow that? How do you know what subject you are passionate about? For that, participants, we need to know the core skills of creative writing. And what are the core skills? They're just that, the core skills. Okay, now I think I will come to some presentations. Are we ready? Pranami, are we ready for some Absolutely. presentations? Yes. Okay, great, great. So let's see, yeah. Mm, okay, the core skills, we already have C. Now this, this core here, The score here has a meaning to it. You see, the C is for connect. You connect with what? You connect with everything around you. You connect with nature. You connect with your friends. You connect with people around you. You connect with birds and bees and animals. You connect with everyone. And then what do you do connecting with them? You observe them. How do you observe? Study them, feel them, they look at their behavior, look at their reactions. And you retain all of it. Where? Here. You retain all of it there so that you can come back to it for reference. You can come back to it. Now, what was it that I connected with some time back? You can think. What was it that I observed in that connect that I made with so-and-so animal or so-and-so person? When you come back to it, after you have retained it, you can express. And how do you express? You use whatever you observed. You use whatever you have connected with, and then you express them beautiful and creatively. And that's how a story is born. That is the core skill of writing. And I guess it goes for everything that is creative. Then we have like just uh, before we started the session, Dipanjal was telling about cooking. And it's amazing, it's surprising how we all uh, kind of link good writing or writing as it is to cooking. See, um, both are somewhat similar, aren't they? One satiates the hunger of the soul and the other satiates the hunger of the stomach. So whatever we have here, I will call it the ingredients. Now for the ingredients, the subject we already told you about, 
and subjects could be human, could be animal, abstract, and these are among the subjects. And then we can have feelings also. These are about um, the, the, the subject and you can have protagonists from them. And when you have protagonists, you can have more than one protagonist. Sometimes they go parallelly. And then you can also have time for your subject, time of war, time of uh, the plague, time of the pandemic. So you can have these also as your subject. These would be abstract subjects, subjects which will not probably have one character, but the time is your character. The space therein is your character. Then you have the genre. This is a very, um, you know, risky thing. The genre is normally the academicians will like to categorize it into four. Fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and drama. However, in between fiction, there is a whole lot of stuff. There will be reality fiction, there will be fantasy fiction, there will be romantic fiction, historical fiction. For the rest, of course, historical fiction, you know, it has something to do with history. Romantic fiction has something to do with romance. But what is reality fiction? Now, reality fiction is also fiction, but it's so contradicting, isn't it? You have reality and you have fiction together as one genre. Reality fiction is a fiction which could have been in reality, but did not. So you're just writing about it. It could have been, it did not. That is reality fiction. But what is nonfiction is what actually happened in reality. That is not fiction. So that is your genre. Then we have the narrative. Narrative could be made in the form of a flashback. It could be made in the form of a letter. It could be made in the form of one person narrating the other in the form of, you know, a dream that occurred to him or her. However, sometimes there is a in and out, in and out flow of narration. Say, um, I'm talking to you now, I'm telling you about uh, a dream, then I come back to my wakeful hours, then I again go back to my dream, then I again come back to my wakeful hours. This is kind of confusing. If it is too much, it confuses the reader and it takes the attention away from the main plot of the story. However, if you can really blend it in very well and smooth, let it be there. It's your story after all. And um, you have seen our uh, folk tales in the Northeast. The whole of India has a lot of fables and folklores and legends. However, in the Northeast, we are more into it. In these folklores, you always see, you notice that there is a blend of verses, songs, narration, everything put together makes a beautiful tale. So this is the form of narration. And in the course of this workshop, in the course of this session, we will see, we will observe that only when we are talking of the ingredients that make up a good story, are we able to separate them. Subject is on one side, genre is on one side, narrative on one side. But when we come to the recipe part, when we come to the actual cooking part, there will be no airtight compartments. When you bake the cake, when you eat it, ah, I'm almost feeling it in my mouth. Anyway, when you're eating the cake, you don't know which is the egg, you don't know which is the flour, and you don't know which is the sugar. Everything is so well blended and you have it all together so well that it, you know, brings the joy in your heart. A good story is just that. The blending has to be very fine, right? Now we come to mood and tone. Mood is what the readers derive from the story and tone is what the writer delivers to the story. It is about the pitch, the rise and the fall. That is the tone. And again, the tone could be sober, could be hilarious. It depends on what mood the writer wants to give to his or her readers. Then we come to language. Yes, one very important thing is that language has to be very simple, very simple. 
in this case, in this case, I always love Ruskin Bond stories. You know, his stories are universal and his language is so very simple. Right from the child who has started probably just reading stories, fiction, up to those people who have sense in them. Everyone. They would all love to go through a Ruskin bond because mainly of the simplicity of the language. And yes, another thing, no cliches, please. Never. Because, you know, when I was small and I got these cliches and sometimes in some stories, I had this very, um, this, I had the sense of being humiliated, you know, that those people know so many things and so many phrases and all, and I don't know them. So that exactly is what, as a writer, I don't want to give to my readers. We all know the same amount of things. And in fact, sometimes other people know more than me because I am always a liar. I just cook up things from nothingness. So cliches are an absolute no-no. And a small scattering of local words and terms, I think, adds charm to the story. It gives a feeling of involvement. It brings uh, the reader to the locale. So I think that is um, an absolute yes from my side. I use very liberally, especially when I write stories uh, relating to um, the Boro villages, the Boro background. I use especially um, the addressings, the re relations, aunts and aunties and uncles. I use them in Boro. And certain other terms are used in Boro. But we, in that case, have to give proper footnotes and glossary. That, that brings a sense of involvement. And then we come to the plot. Okay, the plot is the blueprint, the layout and the outline of the story. Uh, it could be any time, any place, anywhere. You could sit down on a desk and uh, plot down your story like you do your school's uh, projects or your college projects, your thesis and all that. But I personally work out on my plots as I am running about the house, taking my pets up to the terrace and running with them. And I do my plotting that way. I think I work better that way. My mind works better that way. Gives me ideas from what my dogs are doing, what my kids are doing. So then we come to action and drama. The words say that all. These are the highs and lows and the tear jerkers that come into the story. And then climax. That brings about the whole thing, the blending and then the plot, the action, the drama, the fall, the run and everything. And then it comes to the climax. Now, your climax could be there when you're still climbing the story. Or you could bring a gradual slope down and end it in a smooth note. That depends on you, how you want to end your story. Now we come to the recipe. Is this much clear? I guess uh, I'm, I'm okay yes, yes, so far? Yes. Okay, okay. Now we come to the title. Now this is the recipe part of the story cooking. This is the title. The title has to be something catchy, yes, definitely. And it has to be something that sums up the entire story. It is almost like a one word or one line synopsis of the entire story. However, sometimes the title could be so uh, amazingly uh, creatively planted, you know, that that particular word is nowhere found in the entire story, but it has an emotional, um, emotional uh, description of the story. This brings me to, I would like to share with you a story of Dr. the late Dr. Bhavendranath Hoytya, one of his stories titled Ra's Mystery. Some of you might have read it. Yes, nowhere yes. in, yes, Pranami, you read it. So, no story, you know. Ra's mystery means in Ohomia, it is the mason. Nowhere in the story is a mason mentioned or even referred to. However, the story builds up in such a way that emotional concrete walls come up, develop towards the end of the story which is the work of only a mason. 
And it is the abstract Mason that was in work, in action, in the entire plot of the story. But nowhere, never, anywhere in the story was the Mason or the Rhine history included. That was the title that really took me in awe, you know, so I thought of sharing it with you. So title could be that. Sometimes some people put the title first and then they start with the story. It could be either way. You can first write the entire story and then find out something appropriate and then put it on top there. Yeah, so in f uh, for my case also, I do both ways. Sometimes I put the title and then I start the story. Sometimes I write up the story and then I come to the title. Sometimes I put the title, write the entire story and I decide I want to change it. Then I change it. It's your story, feel free. Yes, next we have the opening lines or the opening words. This also has to be very catchy. Um, sometimes the story starts at the end. Like we just talked about flashbacks and we talked about dreams and not in the beginning. So the story could start at the back and then come, 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 come forward. All right. Now, uh, to give an example of catchy lines, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Yes. Pranami, would you like to carry on with the rest? They love two cities. I would love to listen to you first. Oh, okay. I comply with your wishes. It was the best of times. It was the worst times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was winter of despair. Now this one line has run into an entire paragraph and there is no full stop. Mark that the entire paragraph is noted with contradictions. And you look at the blend. This is one of the most beautiful opening stanzas I have ever come across. So it need not be so uh, big. It could be just one line. It could be just one word, but you could make it something catchy. Then we come to the build up. This is where you start moving and weaving your characters and uh, their intentions, their strengths, their weaknesses. This is the part where you will build up your plot. Then we come to the description. This I think is very vital very vital to your uh, story. It has to appeal to all the senses. When we say description, it is not just visual description. It has to be, um, it has to touch your skin. It has to touch your ears. Now, how do you touch your ears? Not like this. Your words should touch your, the ears. So instead of maybe saying, she shouted at the top of her voice, you could maybe say the way she shouted sent electric shock through the ears of the listeners. So something, something that actually gives the shrieking, the, the uh, you know, blaring impact of the shout of the scream. And sometimes the de for descriptions, I think metaphors were great. I am so much into metaphors. Mm -hmm. And then also you, can use these to make the reader see and feel rather than only read. We will come back to descriptions in the next few uh, slides. But before that, we will just do up with this. Then we come to the suspense and curiosity and surprise. These are the elements. These again come back to, like I told you, there is no fine demarcation at the recipe part. Suspense and curiosity and surprise. They will all come and blend in the build up, in the plot. So this is what you want uh, your readers to know, the mood that you want to give. They will also go back to mood. So from now on, there will be no airtight compartment. And then we have the energy. The energy will come from the description, how you describe. And of course, it comes from your choice of words. You have to keep them unique. 
And sometimes, you know, for energy, you will have to break the monotony of narration, give uh, dialogues in between. And this is one very, um, uh, you know, um, I really love doing this. I give a particular style of uh, talking, speech to a particular character. There is not always proper grammatically correct sentences because I write stories mostly for children. A spider maybe or a rabbit maybe uh, could be speaking in language like uh, uh, he, he or she doesn't say, I love reading books. He say, me book reading love. So that particular style of speech, I will stick to, I will adhere to in the entire flow of the story. That has to be uniform though. Like you have noticed when dogs are being made to talk in all those uh, YouTube videos and Instagram videos and all that. Uh, me doing watch, me doing a eat. So the dog doesn't say I'm eating, which is grammatically correct. The dog says me doing a eat, mommy. So this kind of uh, deviation in the properness of language can also bring variety to your story. But if you give that particular uh, uniqueness, exclusivity to a character, you will have to carry it on through the story. Now the center, the rise. So you build up whatever action, the drama, the falls, the highs, you will all bring it in the crescendo. And then the closing words. These will leave the readers in the mood that you wish them to be in, that you wish them to go back after they have shut the book. So be very careful about the closing words. And yes, I told you about description. Rachel Joyce in her book, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Heron Fry, describes a view of the tissue paper sky combed through with cloud. I found it so beautiful because till now, so far, I had always um, described clouds as, you know, uh, looking like the shape of a unicorn or a dinosaur, or it looked like a boat, animals and humans and trees and everything. But this one really caught my attention, combed through with cloud. You see these, um, these strands here? You see these strands here? It looks like the clouds have been combed through the sky. That's one. And then we come to, now these will be illustrations from my award-winning book. I just wanted to share with you. The protagonist of my book, the one that won the award, is a 10-year-old boy and his name is Barsao. This is Barsao's grandfather. And this is Barsao, and this is his younger brother. They are learning to ride a bicycle. This is the time when Barsao just heard stories about ghosts from his grandfather when they were sitting by the fire. And so everything, his, his grandfather narrated a story telling them about a ghost which appeared as a dwarf, bald-headed. So every time Barsao saw someone short and bald-headed, he thought it was a ghost. So this is that picture. Now this is Barsao. Barsao used to bunk classes quite a number of times. And that was the time when he got caught and his father tied him to a post at home and he was put there. And this was the time in another story. These are all short stories, interconnected short stories. This was the time when some of their adventures led to the running away of uh, Muso, the cow. Now, Muso in Boro means cow. And it also comes to the English word moo. Moo is how the cows call, yes. So Muso, this, the mother cow is called Muso and this is her baby, they have family. And then there was a time when Barsao fell into the well. Now, this is why I wanted to show you these pictures because I have a purpose in it with description. You have seen all of it. Now the thing is we want the story to come alive with more description. How was the fire? Was it crackling? 
Barsao's heart that day was sad, like it was raining. And then here, he was so scared, he thought everything was ghosts around him. So just to see this, you will have to describe these in words. We will see the reactions, the, the descriptions as they happen. Now just look at this. Um, can you can you get the um, voice, the audio? Absolutely. You get the music in the audio? No. In the video? You don't get no. the music? No, no, no. Okay, okay. Just, just, yes. Now I think you should get it. <laughs> Okay, so could you feel the story? Did you hear the music there the second time round? Yes, yes, Rashmi Bhavi did. Okay, great. So, um, then we go on to the next slide. Okay, we go on to the next slide. Now we come to Ganesh. Now we come to the garnish in the recipe. We have finished with the ingredients. We have finished with our recipe. Now we come to the garnish, which is the cream and better still, the cherry on top of the cake. Okay. The garnish is what you will normally not get on the internet. Let's see what they are. The prelude or the preface, which is a background to the story. Sometimes, you know, if you're writing about uh, legends, so you could just give a brief before you start the main story. You could give a brief so the reader knows what is the background of your story. Otherwise, you know, sometimes it will just be um, Greek and Latin because they will not know on what basis you're writing some characters and on what basis you're naming them. So it would be a good idea to give a prelude or a preface. Then we have the sketch, the map, or a power chant. The sketches you have seen in a lot of books, illustrations coming in the beginning of the book. They kind of give you an impression of what kind of visuals or what kind of things are expected in the book. And map as it is, um, as it is uh, inferred, will give you an idea of which imaginary place because we are all uh, making up a non-existent place and we will put it in such a way that will make it appear. Pranami, you get me? Yes, yes. Okay, I just, something just flipped up on the screen, like my internet connection is not stable. That's why I got oh, this. Okay. okay. So the map is to give the readers an impression of where the story happened or where we made it to happen. Then we come to the power chant. The power chant is something which stays on with the reader for all time, for at least quite a few years at least. Say for instance, et tu brute. That is one thing that has hung on. For even those who did not read uh, Julius Caesar, I think et tu brute stayed on. Then, not all those who wander are lost. Any guesses? Sorry, Story King. Sorry. Not all those who wander are lost. Okay. So do we have any yes. guesses from our participants? Let me check in the chat. 
Okay, I think in the meantime, we can just carry on. We'll come back to it because uh, we have a factor. This is Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. However, even for those who haven't okay, read one it. One response, uh, Rashmi Ba, one response, and that was a correct one from the participant. See. Yeah. Absolutely. You've mm -hmm. done wonderful. Absolutely. Yes. So participants, and, we would actually love more of interactions, okay? And um, In between, yeah. yes, yes, we're coming to it. Maybe they don't want to bother me in the midst of this uh, presentation. But yes, when I want... Yeah, when I'll yeah. 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 come back, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then we come to the power chant, but the power chant is also actually a power quote. And then the pause. Now, again, there is a fine blend between the power chant and the pause. The pause totally alters the impression of the story. I'll give you an example from one of the finest, greatest epics, the Mahabharata. It was said, Ashwatthama Hatha Iti, Narova Kunjarova. There was a pause. Ashwatthama Hatha a pause, and a drop in tone. Iti, Narova Kunjarova. Now, for those who aren't acquainted with the epic, it is the time of the Kurukshetra. Yudhisthira runs into the middle of the battlefield and shouts, Ashwatthama Hatha. Now, Ashwatthama is the name of Dronacharya's son. Ashwatthama also is the name of an elephant. And Dronacharya was invincible. He could not be brought down unless he had to be emotionally, um, you know, shattered. He had to be emotionally shattered only to bring him down. So this was something they deployed. And it was only Yudhisthira whom they would all believe because he always spoke the truth. And Yudhisthira refused to tell a lie in the middle of the battlefield. So what the ploy was that he would shout out, and just to keep his conscience clear, he would say the rest of it in a lower tone after a pause. But the alteration was already done. That small pause, that small tone dropping had altered the entire direction of the entire epic. Otherwise, history probably would have been different. The epic would have been probably different. So that is the power of the pause. That is the power of the drop of tone. Now we come to the exclamation. When we're talking face to face, I can say, oh my God, I can say that. But how do you do it when you're writing? We have the exclamation mark. Use that. And then we have the punctuations. This is one amazing section. For punctuations, you know, this is an entirely grammar chapter for English uh, academics. However, we will stick to only those which are uh, relevant in creative writing. The full stop plays an important role. The comma plays an important role. Now I'll tell you, if you want to really hit your readers, bang, 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 go ahead, unabashedly use the full stop. Few sentences, for example, the trigger clicked, the bullet darted through the stillness, it hit its mark, Ashuvi dropped, dead. Now, if you really want to hit your readers, use the stop after every sentence. But if you want to just smoothly and fluidly bring it down to the fact that Ashuvi is dead, then you use and and you use the comma. The trigger clicked and the bullet darted through the stillness and it hit its mark and Ashuvi dropped. Ashuvi was dead. So that is kind of a very soft end to Ashuvi. This is again the power of the punctuation and it depends on what tone you wish to set for the readers. What feeling you want to give to the reader. Just like we had the Prelude here, we can have the epilogue 
at the end of the story. Now these, whatever we are discussing in the garnishing is not at all part of your main story. These are the frills, these are the icings and the cherries. Now the epilogue could be a sentence, could be a paragraph, could be a page. It is just a stylish conclusion and a wrapping up of your entire story. It could also be a trailer of a sequel if you're planning one. Now we come to some amazing punctuation errors, okay? I call them punctuation pokes. Check that out. Who would like to read that without punctuation? Let's see, Grandpa. So what does it mean? It's almost like, let's eat an ice cream. Do we really want to eat grandpa? Oh my God, no. So <laughs> what, yes, so what we needed here is a comma between eat and grandpa. Then it is like, come grandpa, let's eat. Otherwise you see the entire meaning of the sentence changes and one meaning in one sentence Change means your entire story deviates from the main thing. It deviates from the plot. We don't want that to happen. And we come to this. I love cooking my family and my pets. Oh my God, not me, not me, not at all. Here again, I don't love to cook my family and my pets like I love to cook carrots and peas. So we would like to have comma somewhere here. I love cooking comma, my family, comma, and my pets, there'll be a full stop here. These are basic punctuations which alter the entire story. That's why I'm coming to it and discussing them like we are nursery kids. Never mind, we all are kids. I really love your uh, uh, use of the word pokes, punctuation pokes. This, that's so intriguing and, oh, you know, and very that's my interesting. I, I told you, I'm a liar. So I put in my innovation and my creativity in whichever place I find possible. This is very interesting. Look at this. You are one liar. I'm sure, you know, everybody loves around to have. Yeah. Oh my God. I hope you're not lying there. No, I'm not yet a writer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're about to, you have half done works. So you're half a liar. Oh okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're half a liar, half a liar. Now, look at this. Ekhane jabra rakhbe. That's in Bengali. Ekhane jabra rakhbe. Full stop. Na rakhle dondo dia hobe. Now, the meaning is leave garbage here. If you don't, you will be punished. This entire total alteration of the sentence happened because of the small stop here which should not have been here it should have been here you get it then yeah. it would have been ekhane jabra rakhbe na rakhle dondo diya hobe don't leave garbage here if you do you will be punished but that small full stop changed the entire meaning of the sentence this you will have to read at your own peril pause I can only tell you where the punctuation should have come in. Any guesses? Any guesses? You will read that aloud at your own peril, participants. Yes? We have, uh, in the chat box, we have Anuz. Anurag Bhattacharya writes Anuz. A -N so there precisely absolutely of course yes we have an apostrophe between you and us you and us yes so it is anu's dry cleaners and not the way it has been put here i found them very interesting now these are again some more punctuation folks but they don't really alter the meaning of the story these are just maybe errors and unnecessary sometimes the hut was in the hills by the stream that flowed down to the valley. Now, this exclamation was totally unnecessary. You're not exclaiming like that flowed down to the valley. No, it's not like that. A full stop would have sufficed. 
and all of these commas are unnecessary. Now we come to the Oxford comma. Jerry bought pens, Pringles, cookies, and butter from the store. We really need the commas here because we are differentiating words, but the last comma before the and is something which you can use, which you cannot use. It is not mandatory, but if you use it once in the story, please keep it uniform all through. So next we come to the hiccups. We're done with the ingredients. We're done with the recipe. We're done with the cooking. I guess in between we have eaten some too. Now we come to the hiccups. First and foremost, the writer's block. I guess we all have gone through it. And we all have our own ways of dealing with the writer's block. What I have, how I deal with it, may be completely different with how Pranami deals with it because she is half a liar. <laughs> yeah. I normally deal with it by taking the babies, my pets, up uh, to the terrace or running around with them. Or I would like to sip into a big mug full of um, tea. Or I would also like to listen to some music or read some different story by some other writers and totally take off my mind away from the story that blocked me out. So after I go out or maybe in between, I would like to watch a movie as well. So after I have completely detached myself from the story and do all these activities and maybe a day or maybe even two, I'll come back to it, I'll refresh. And then I have a different perspective into the story and my block is no more there. That's how I deal with it. These are all personal things. And these, I think in the trial and error process, you will come to deal with them. Then we come to the fact, how descriptive should the description be? This is very interesting. Um, adverbs and adjectives don't really qualify as descriptions. And then we would also like to avoid vague and abstract descriptions, and they should not slow down the pace of the narration. Then also, the description should have a purpose. You should know what you are describing and when you are describing. These two are very, very important. What and when. You cannot be describing the romance of a beautiful moonlit night sky. When down below on the streets or in the jungles, you are narrating in a very fast paced boat, the gunfight of a chase and a chase between smugglers and the cops and there are bullets and there are grenades everywhere down there and you're describing the night sky. No, that's I think a little out of place. This is where the description tends to um, detract the reader. So next we come to rigidity of structure. This is why I told you right at the beginning, you will observe and absorb everything from this session, keep it in there and come back to it only for reference and you will not use every word to the head. Why? Because we have discussed plot, we have discussed blueprint, we have discussed the characters, we have discussed how the protagonist could be, we have discussed everything in very uh, methodical structures. It is almost like, you know, um, very scientific. No, we don't want story writing to be scientific at all. But to have a proper layout, a proper plot, I think somewhere that also is necessary. But there should not be a rigidity of structure. Mm -hmm. Because as you proceed along the story, you will notice that you need to add one character or you need to remove a subplot. When you need to accommodate these changes, you need flexibility. You need room in your story to accommodate these changes. You do not need the rigidity of structure. This is another major hiccup. 
you have notes put up everywhere on your desk and on your whiteboard behind you when you're writing stories um, to stick to them. That's a good idea, but leave some space for accommodations. Then we come to the subplots ousting the main plot. So the subplots should be supports, like a walking stick just supports it cannot be the leg it just supports so the subplot needs to just support the main plot and that's it you need to maybe put in small uh, descriptions to the subplot but don't stray along too far describing the subplot the subplot the subplot and then finally you realize that your subplot has become the main plot and you forgot about your main plot this is why right at the beginning we had a question pranami someone said uh, about writing a story but towards the end i uh, lost track of where it started and what happened in between and what uh, the end results were so yeah. this precisely it somewhere along the subplot has taken over so that i think should not be and then the narration also need to be such that the subplots only have to be fillers. Like the music, the background music in uh, a theater. They are just the fillers. They need not be the main thing. So yes, we have come to the end of this. And now I think... We can take up questions now? But I must take tell you... Questions. Yes, I must tell you, you know, this uh, this evening you have um, prepared an excellent dish called storytelling, the art of storytelling. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> to the extent that this session has made me hungry, hungry to write, falter and keep writing. I know. Uh, until hungry to eat as well, Pranami. Yes. Your Maggie. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. So uh, we'll go to the question, uh, question answer sessions. You know, I would just like to add in something, you know, when you were talking sure, about, sure. Class, you know, when um, something just came to my mind, like when I'm teaching a novel to my students, I call these subplots a foil. So, um, yes. uh, yeah, I, because they act as, uh, you know, the like you said, the background musics and all. So they act as a foil to the main protagonist or the main plot, you know. True, uh, true. So that's a narrative technique kind of which the writer uses wherever he doesn't, he or she doesn't want to maybe directly enhance on the main plot. So, mm -hmm. I mean, my understanding of exactly what you said, you know, maybe mm -hmm. just, I, you know, just I use the word foil. So, no, I mean, that, that exactly it is. That exactly it is. You I just need the subplot. Because you don't, uh, you cannot have just one person and you right. cannot just uh, narrate the life of just one person. You need right. to have others so that the story builds up. Right. But yes, if you pay too much attention, they are a foil. You're correct yeah. there. Yeah. So um, we can move to the questions now, I believe. So I hope uh, you are me... well marinated, Pranami. This <laughs> is the roast and the grill session. <laughs> when it comes to food, okay. yes. I hope you are well marinated, prepared for the questions, yes. Sort of, yeah. All yes, right. So this is from, um, I think this is the very first question. Um, I would just read out, perhaps, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so many of the questions must have been answered so far, you know, by now, um, through your presentation. But even then, you know, the first question was from Drishti Rao. And okay. uh, she says, you know, I do write stories, but I feel that they aren't as interesting and magnetic. Uh, so I would like to know how to make them appealing to the readers. Description, my dear, description. Yes, not my dear Watson. Later I came to know that there was no such theme as elementary, my dear Watson. So dear, there is something I'm telling you, description, my dear, description. It has to appeal to the senses. And for descriptions, you have to really observe and connect with nature and everything else you see, which we worked out in the first slide, the core right. skills. I think that will answer your question. 
I I think so. Yeah, description is just so important. I mean, perhaps you know the description may not be you know pages and pages long. Even if it's a no, small, they need not to be. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh huh. Even if it's a it's a paragraph. You know, it's a small paragraph. You know, it mm -hmm. it matters. You know how you can you know just like the poems haiku. You know, they are just three lines maybe, but then you know they surmise so many things in them. So absolutely. yeah, you're absolutely right. Description is so important. Uh mm huh. -hmm. And they have to appeal to all the senses. Appeal to all, That's right? Precisely it. Yes, yes. yes. Um, okay, so moving, uh, moving ahead, we have a mm -hmm. question from Diksha, and she says, "I try to write a story, um, short story, but after I finish the story, I notice I had written so long story that the teachers are not even interested to read it. Oh dear! So why the teachers? Are you interested in reading it? Are you interested in reading it? Your long story, if it is too long, what are you writing about? What are you narrating in it? If it's a short story which has really gone too long, then maybe you would like to work on it and maybe extend it further into a novel. And uh, if it's something close to your heart, work on it. Maybe some flow, some pattern changes in it will still make it interesting. The problem here is not the length of your story. The yeah. problem probably is the content of the story, the build-up, the plot, and the characterization of the story. Mm -hmm. So, if it is interesting, you would read any length of stories. You sure read Harry Potter's this big fat novels. So, it's not about the length. You work it out, make it more interesting. Use the slides for reference. Create your story. I'm sure it's going to be a beautiful four. You just change the one plus one plus one plus one. Change it. Maybe it should be three plus one. Maybe it should be four plus zero. Try changing that, and your four will still be beautiful. Yes. Right. Does that answer the question? I think so precisely because that uh, you know answers uh, to a lot of things that was going on in my mind as well while reading her question. Okay. So, great. so Diksha, uh, keep writing. Don't worry about the length of your story. Don't worry about the length. Don't Absolutely. And your problem is not the length. Your problem is inside what is there in the length. So, fine. Yeah. Okay. Some of the some of the best books so far, you know, uh, even even some of the books, you know, best novels so far, which have been included in English literature syllabus across the world, are you know this big fat. So you need yes. not worry about the. You need not worry at all. <laughs> That's what I said precisely. Length is not the problem. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Rashmi Ba, moving ahead to the next question. This is from sure. Anurag. Sure. Yes. I'm a person who loves, uh, who just loves fictional stories with uh, sudden, with sudden and unexpected twists. Okay. My role, my role model is Rick Riordan, who wrote the Percy Jackson series, amongst okay. many of his books. So, is there any particular way in which I can enhance the suspense in my books? Again, you will have to use the core skills. You will have to observe nature. So, you see what, how things react and behave in nature. And then do just the opposite maybe of that. You know, because when you're writing about a, a rabbit running, 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 and a tortoise also falling. I'm just giving you an example. Mm -hmm and the tortoise following, everyone knows that the tortoise comes last. The rabbit uh, wins, but he takes a rest in between. So ultimately it's the, uh, the tortoise that goes ahead. However, since you have observed, since you have connected with the rabbit and the tortoise, these are metaphors. I'm saying this to make you connect with the nature, with animals and everything. So you know the twist, give it a double twist. You make a change differently. You make it like this, that maybe what the tortoise did was he rolled down on his shell and slid down like a ski board. Right. So that kind of, that kind of endings also. You will have to keep your antennae open. Absolutely. Watch and give your twist. Make it more into suspense. Yes, you definitely will be able to bring in the suspense. Right. Mm -hmm. So this this also you know brings to my mind i was just seeing for the i think sixth or seventh time the uh, movie um, angels and demons by dan brown you know the other day 
just two days back i think because i like it so much and so you know the twist there you know the hype about illuminati coming back but actually it's not illuminati but then how church finally we come to know that how church uses the idea of illuminati coming back you know that twist right right so, yes yes it can be kind of anything you know just has to be a mm. little bit logical yeah mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. yeah. so the anything, example anything whatever whatever uh, you know readers are expecting you just change it at the end yes right yes. and so, and just go on because you're writing fiction you have all liberty to be wacky with your imagination go ahead just use it you don't need to be right there you can always be the full fledged liar <laughs> yes okay so and, that is uh, answered i believe mhm yes perfect so Thank and uh, now moving ahead to a uh, next question um okay um okay this is a very um, pertinent simple yet pertinent question that you know it's is it very important to have strong vocabulary to start with i think you had said somewhere in your presentation you know big words you know jargons are not important not at, at all. all not at, at all. all not at yeah. all keep your language very simple because yes. you want a greater section of your readers to come and read your book and uh, all sections not just those who know big fat bombastic words but they also have to uh, cater to the needs of the humbler readers like me and i don't have uh, a knowledge of two big fat words in my dictionary but i am a good reader so if you want to cater to readers like me keep your language very simple start with something very simple keep your words simple so that's it you don't have to have uh, huge words but you uh, have to know how you play with the words like we used it was the best of times it was the worst of times yeah. each and every word here is so simple but you just see how they have been framed how the contradiction has been played here so that's it you'll be able to and there's no need to uh, use very big fat words yes okay so rashmi ba we are actually getting a receiving a lot of questions but uh-huh. due to time constraints maybe we can have two to three more questions uh, okay. is it okay, okay. With you? two or three more I, questions i i leave that entire roasting and grilling to you pranami <laughs> okay okay yes. all right so mm-hmm. uh, some questions uh, i would have to leave because i think that you know um, they have been touched upon already so some questions are common so i Good. am leaving them out okay so there is um, um so in which case uh, the questions that you have left because you feel they have already been answered in the course of the session i hope uh, uh, the participants are okay with it because it was mainly your your purpose was to get your questions answered i hope you have found your answers Okay. Yes. If anybody, uh, see, we will, we, uh, dear participants, we will uh, take two or three more questions. And if you think that you know some uh, uh, any of your queries have not been addressed, you can in, just mention in the chat box. We would take up your question again. So um, this question is uh, the next question is from okay anonymous attendee. I have an idea for my story, but I'm not able to express it. Okay. it's it's i don't think it's exactly writers block but um, what would you say about it rashmi ba ah uh, yes your problem here is expression i think you need to really talk how much do you talk are you a really very talkative person are you a very talkative person i don't know i'm just asking because you know when you talk you express so much about yourself about what you think so never mind if your uh, problem is expression write a lot write a lot and i would suggest you write on pages on paper pages not on computer screens i would suggest you write on paper pages scribble and read them and if you find something not correct keep that don't throw it keep that write again on another page then you compare the two and see maybe you want to pick up the best from both the sheets and then put them on the third sheet so this is how gradually after practice you will be able to express what you 
have in your mind your concepts you will be able to express and in the meantime maybe you would like also to read some books so you know how the flow of language brings out expression and sometimes you need to be descriptive sometimes you need to follow the pitch the tone the mood all these will maybe come later but the basic thing for you is to express never mind you start with writing on paper with pen you start with writing so you know what happens that way you have it handy all the while keep it by your bedside keep it in your pockets so suddenly when you want to go over it you just take it out read it and then you know oh i have written this like this here but maybe i want to write it this way instead so you again jot it down then after a while when you have finished that sheet you take up another right there and then you compare that's what i told you you compare and then you put the best out of the two sheets in the third now i'm just giving you an example of using two sheets you can use bundles and bundles of paper go ahead express stopping you yes i think you have beautifully answered this question and uh, your answer i think has captured to a lot of questions together because i oh, see good. three good. four more questions you know maybe they have expressed themselves in different ways but then you know they mean to ask the same thing so okay. uh, i'm yeah. so glad if i am being of some help to someone i'm so of glad course. in which case of course yeah. you are being you know uh, of lot of help to so many rashmi bhai uh, i think you. we'll take one more question here um this is from yashomana any special mm -hmm. attention we need to apply while writing fantasy fiction any special any specific or special attention that we need to apply uh, while writing fantasy fiction fantasy fiction itself answers your question fantasy you fantasize just close your eyes fantasize and write down whatever comes there you can have rashmi aunty with horns and mustache and beard fantasize anything there is no rule there is no method that's why it's called fantasy go ahead feel free yes so uh yeah thank you for that all those answers in fact rashmi ba i think um without uh, you know offending anybody you know since we have time constraints and i have tried to uh, do justice to everyone uh, i've tried to collate a lot of questions together and place some specific questions to you so that you know i try to cater to everyone in some way and you have done a wonderful job pranami <laughs> thank you yes. but you have in fact you know you know we are getting a lot of messages in the chat box also you know that how wonderfully this session has been conducted and um, yes. yes i have you know uh, uh, attended a couple of uh, workshops on writing so far and you know i i must tell you you know not because you are the speaker and i am the moderator here i must tell you you know this is by far one of the best and um, the way you know so simply yet lucidly you have explained stuff and very organized categorical and it was really really nice rashmi ba thank you so much thank you so much and i'm thank sure you, all our attendees all our participants have been benefited to a large extent and um, okay uh, one sec pranami i would just like to read out yes. this particular yes. the last message oh yes yes how can i miss out that yes. absolutely it 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 just says thank you for the presentation to both speaker and moderator uh, dr sandhya narsari you have to thank backstage team as well which includes dipankar jakaria which includes um dipanjal deka and dhruva hazarika and uh, vasavi acharya and reshma ensisha and from my backstage i have to thank jeraj and sandhya yes okay <laughs> okay thank you so much you have actually you know uh, lessened you know my work and you have uh, shared rather my load and you know done that you know and so i you know i thank everyone backstage really i thank everyone with us today who have uh, helped us in every way possible organizing this and um, yes. 
of course our uh, president uh, mr dhruba hazarika is also here and he is even though he is uh, present here kind of in absentia but then you know we uh, um, uh, owe a lot to him for his constant guidance yes, uh, yes. in whatever way we, whatever way he can even even though i understand he's keeping quite busy with a lot of writing projects that he has so mm -hmm. uh, having said that i once again thank everybody and um, dear participants keep writing so um, you know understand that to tell stories um, is not only to illuminate the reality of our world but it also uh, but it also means to um, envision very clearly the kind of world we want to live in right yes. yeah. keep right. writing keep faltering you might falter many times like i said before but keep writing okay. and also yes. very important keep reading keep reading okay mm -hmm. you Correct. must know Correct. cinderella you must know tejimola right true, you must true. know Very the entire true. range of entire gamut of characters and writers and books so all best keep writing and i'm sure you know we would have lot of good writers from our region very soon on the national and international pedestal right absolutely okay thank you so much stay safe stay happy okay. and continue to be liars bye bye no, bye 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 Bye. Have a great evening, everybody.